Okay, so when you are speaking or writing, public speaking or writing an essay, you have to consider your audience, right? You have to consider your audience. Like, are you writing for admissions? Are you writing for your girlfriend? Are you writing, are you speaking as a eulogy for people who are mourning someone's death? Right? Are you, uh, Bru uh, are you Brutus talking about justifying why you killed Caesar? Are you Mark Antony to combat what Brutus said to take over and have a civil war? Right? So, in the Gettysburg Address, it was a big Union victory. Right? It was, it was the high watermark of the Confederacy, right? It was the first Civil War battle fought on northern soil, right? Just like 20 miles, about 20 miles or so, uh, across the border from Maryland. They were looking for shoes, right? The Confederates. Uh, and it was a three-day battle in July, and it was a big Union victory for General Meade and also Lincoln, who really wanted to keep Europe out of the battle. All right? They wanted, they wanted the battle. They, didn't want, did it, they did not want England to be part of the, you know, the, the, the Confederacy. So he says, okay, how do I address this? All right? I have to think of my audience here. It's November. All right, so a few months have gone by. We still had another two years to fight this awful civil war. Red states, blue states, you get it. We still have the same thing, the same nonsense today. Um, and he wants to pick the best words possible. Now, Lincoln read most of Shakespeare, if not all of Shakespeare. He was also very, very, very influenced by the King James Version of the Bible, right? Largely self-taught, right? Lincoln knew words. He knew how to construct sentences and be effective in a way that few do today, right? So here we have the Gettysburg Address, if you, if you open it up, and the first person that spoke that day on November 19th was this guy, Edward Everett. He was a well-known speaker, right? An orator. He was the chief speaker, and he spoke for two hours. Imagine listening to a speech for two hours. That guy, you would have to be the Chris Rock, right? You would have to be so funny right? To entertain me for two hours. What's that? Who? Is that a comedian? Hey, who? <laughs> no, it's like, what? 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 <laughs> I know it. Anyway. All right. So, but Lincoln's speech, guys, Lincoln comes up and it's just 272 words. If we had the right priorities, I would have you memorize this speech. Maybe, maybe I'll do that. Maybe. What was it? All right. It lasted two minutes, and it became one of the greatest speeches of all time. So, guys, when I say how long does it need to be, yeah, 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 yeah. Page eight, and now I know. Now I know. Okay. But even, I don't think he could do it for two hours. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Anyway, guys, so Lincoln comes up. Two minutes, 272 words, but every single word counts, all right? I want you to, as you listen to this, we're going to listen to it twice. Read it, listen to it. I want you to do a rhetorical analysis of this, not in an essay form, just what do you see happening right now based on what you know about rhetorical appeals, ethos, logos, pathos, and if you don't know what those are, uh, I'll, 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 I'll say, okay, drop and give me 20. But not yet. Not yet, Lisa, okay? Next week, drop and give me 20. 
Right. Also, I want you to see where the appeals are. Okay, where do you see the anaphora? Where do you see the epistrophe? Okay, you got it? Okay. All right, guys, Lincoln begins with an allusion to both the Constitution, all right, four score and seven years ago, also to the Bible. All right, so when you want to connect to something that's huge, you want to echo what had come previously, especially when it's as big as the Constitution and the King James Bible. All right, we have fathers conceiving like your fathers conceived you, right? You were all conceived, right? It's a miracle you guys are all here. What are, what are the chances of you being here? Think of the odds of you being here. I mean, one trillion to one? I don't know, it's, it's cr crazy that that one sperm got to that one egg at that exact time. All right, so he's using conception. Fathers conceiving liberty in a new nation with the proposition, and this was new in the world, that all men are created equal. All right. Martin Luther King is going to expand on that. So will women, too, with the suffragettes and the, and the Seneca Convention. And he says, now we are engaged in a great civil war. What does he mean by great? Does he mean like it's great? Like, this is great. Mr. Bound, you're great, or Mr. Bound, you're bad. No. So great meaning big. This is a big civil war. Also, it's a paradox. This is not great. So he's using great here on different levels, right? Meaning it's huge, but this is not great. And we're testing whether that nation or any nation, that repetition of nation, so conceived, he goes back to conception and dedicated, can this baby that was born out of the birth canal of liberty, right, endure? Or is it going to stay in NICU and die? Right? And he says, we are men on a great, there's that word great again. Great meaning big, historic, but also the paradox that this is not great of that war. Simple sentence, right? We have come to dedicate, that's why we're here, this is, this is the occasion, we have come to dedicate a portion of that field. R repeating battlefield, the big, the big battlefield, I've been to Gettysburg like 20 times, it's like one of my holiest places in the world, and I know it, I, I can walk that, I can walk, I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing. But just a little portion, right? As a final resting place who gave their lives that this nation might live. There's that word live again about conception, okay? And he says, it's fitting and proper that we do this. That's just logos. It's a simple, dramatically short sentence. But, okay, he changes it. In the larger sense, and here he does anaphora. Guys, you should be taking notes of this. We cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. Oh, man. We cannot hollow this ground. You look at those M dashes. This is, this, is, this is brilliant. In the larger sense, in the smaller sense, we're dedicating this, this field right here. You can still go there today, and you can see where Lincoln dedicated this field and where he spoke. But we cannot do, we cannot dedicate, we cannot concentrate, we cannot hollow this ground. Why? Because the brave men living and dead, that's antithesis, right? Write down antithesis, living and dead, who struggled here, not fought here, struggled here, have consecrated it. He's repeating the word consecrate because we can't concentrate. <laughs> they've, they've consecrated it. And far above our poor powered out of the track. This is understatement. Lincoln is saying he has poor power? <laughs> no, he doesn't. He knows what he's doing. Listen, it's like, listen, I'm just a simple scholar. I'm just very, you know, are you really? This is like understatement. But he does mean it above our poor power, not my poor power. We're a nation. Our poor power to add or detract. Antithesis. I got to keep going.
All right. And he says, the world will little note. The world will little note? Nor long remember what we say here? Notice he's not saying I. Right? He's not a president who would use I. We have presidents who use I. I'm the best. I'm, I'm the, um, it's me. And, uh, no, he's saying we are. It's a collective. This is our nation, right? South and North, red states and blue states. Okay? And he says the world will no longer remember. It's one of the most historic speeches of all time, right? And I think Lincoln knows this, but he does not want to make his speech what it's about. It's really about those that died here and struggled here testing whether this nation can live, this baby, this child of liberty. The French Revolution did not bring forth liberty. It brought forth Napoleon. The Russian Revolution did not bring forth liberty. It brought forth communism and Stalin and now Putin, right? Julius Caesar dying to preserve the Republic brought Augustus Caesar the first Roman emperor, right? So revolutions fought to give power to the people, rarely give power to the people, except ours, right? And we'll see, you know, we're still young as a country. Anyway, but this is a test. But it can never forget what they did here, right? Notice the epistrophe. They won't, say, they won't remember what we say here, we, but it can never forget what they did here. R repeating here. It is for us, the living, again, the collective, rather to be dedicated here, again, that word here, to the unfinished work, which they who fought here, notice the repetition of here, here, have thus far nobly advanced. Adjectives, adverbs are bad, but sometimes placed just correctly, it's perfect. Notice this is one of a few adverbs because great writers don't use adjectives and adverbs, my friends. They don't. But simply, boom. Like Hemingway's, uh, they were all waiting reasonably for the train. They were all waiting reasonably. Okay, anyway. It is rather for us, again, the collective, to be here, here again, dedicated to the great, notice that word is used again, great task remaining before us, M dash, that from these honored dead, nice adjective there, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Wow. You take a measure of something. Like, you love your country? Oh, I sure do. What is the ultimate price you can pay for that love? It's dying. It's dying for that child of liberty. Right? It's dying for it. The last full measure. Right? It's a beautiful of devotion. That we here highly resolve, there's an adverb, that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, okay, religious nation, shall, shall is a, is a, is a, Biblical word, we don't use shall so much anymore. I like the actual uh, Hebrew word, timshul, which means mayest, and thou mayest. I like that because that's choice. It has advocacy for someone. Not, it's not a command, right? So I could give another lecture on that. That we hear highly resolve these undead, that this need under God shall have a new birth, conception of freedom, right? All this conception and that government of the people, by the people, for the people. That is a beautiful use of anaphora of, well, it's actually, it's, an, it's parallel structure using epistrophe because he's emphasizing people. Sometimes you guys use, you use repetition, but you're not emphasizing the essential word you're emphasizing some other word that's not meaningful. But here it's people shall not perish from the earth, right? And again, using biblical language that this birth shall not perish from the earth, right? What an amazing speech.